Cool? Okay. Cool. Three, two, one. Hello, Facebook world, and welcome to another podcast. And I am so excited about today's guest. She is the editor in chief over at the pet food industry, pet food forum conferences, and related media to publications. And Debbie, you've been around since 2006. We were just talking earlier about 2007. So, like, your introduction to this industry must have been like, holy smokes. Yeah, I started in August of six, and uh, I had people reporting to me who'd been in the industry a while, and they were able to impress upon me, this is a watershed moment for the industry, for consumers. But I think it was really enlightening, eye-opening. I don't think enough people really understood how pet food is made. The fact that you know not every company can make their own food or make every kind of food they sell. And so, so there are places, and there still are, and they're worth the time, that do what's called co-manufacturing. And that's where a lot of the problems happen, was from one large co-manufacturer in Canada, in fact. And, um, and so I think it was just such an eye-opening experience for everyone, for consumers, for the, the industry, for retailers, for veterans. And you know that to me was the thing that still sticks with me today. I was listening to a podcast that you were doing with Alltech where you were saying that it was so impactful that it, it, it was probably the first time that pet owners actually started to question what the heck is in my food. That was like such a traumatic and such a a culture shifting event and then almost a decade later comes DCM and what's that doing to the industry today what is your take on what what you're seeing what's happening within the pet industry space well i think you're right you know we talked about how the melamine recalls were such a culture shifting and it's a good good way to put it and so then i think when you know you get this announcement from fda you know it's the agency that oversees how pet food is made and, and marketed in the United States, it's, and so it's important. And they come out with this alert. We see, we think we see this link between, you know, we see this, we've seen these new cases of canine dilated cardiomyopathy, and they most of them have been needing a grain from food. So we're seeing if there's a link there. And I I understand where they were coming from, but I think they didn't. I don't think they really understood what kind of impact it would have. With there being just so little information, you know, they 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 stressed that you know there's no link to no link established. You know, there's we're still doing an investigation, but the headline seized on, oh, is grain free food bad? You know, should I stop feeding my? You know, should you stop feeding your pet grain free food, et cetera, et cetera? And I mean, it really caused a whole lot of concern and panic and stuff that I think it was was unnecessary. Um, the other the other thing that's difficult is as bad as the melamine recalls were, and obviously they were terrible because, you know, so many pets died or got really sick and it was awful. Um, the, the good part is that they figured out what was happening fairly quickly in a matter of weeks. You know, they were able to do the research and say, okay, this, you know, bad wheat gluten was put in this, you know, was shipped from a Chinese supplier and, um, and, you know, Combined with some other ingredients and cause these, you know, these this kind of ad cause kidney problems. You know, so they at least were able to identify it. Problem with what's happening now with DCM and has been since their first, you know, FDA's first alert in July of 2018 was that we still don't know anything really. I mean, there's such a complex issue and amorphous issue, and that you know, there's just no way to know is it these particular ingredients? Is it how they interact with other ingredients? Is it genetics? Because you know, there's there's a lot of people in the industry now so we're looking more at the whole genetic picture, um, you know, because DCM has been known to affect certain breeds. But really, if you look at the literature going back several, you know, decades, it's present in a lot of breeds, um, not necessarily prevalent. So it's it's just it's, it's just there's just so little still known. And I'm sure there's the things are farther along than they were in 2000, you know, July of 2018, but not enough for anyone to be able to come out and say anything definitive. And, you know, that just that just causes all this anxiety and uncertainty and a lot of fear. And I don't blame, you know, a, I wouldn't blame a pet parent for who's feeding grain free food. Go, oh, my gosh, am I killing my cat or my dog? You know, I mean, it, it, and there are some that unfortunately have had their dog um, or, you know, become very ill or even died. So, 
Yeah, it's just it's it's just a it's a really um, there are parallels with the melanin thing, but there are also just vast differences. And you know, it's unfortunately, and I don't, and you know, I've heard that it could take another few years for people for anyone to finally get to the bottom of it because it is such a complex issue. And there's so there's almost I wouldn't say there's too many people looking into it, but I'm not sure that they're all collaborating, all the different people, all the different researchers looking into it. So that I think could be an issue too. I remember when I was speaking with uh, Dr. Greg Aldrich, he thought it could be five years maybe before something could come to surface as what's going on. I, I noticed in the media, there's articles now that are out. Um, there was one that had recently been published. I think it was by uh, NBC, the title of the article. It's it's not going away. Vets still seeing cases. Now, today, yes. today, Debbie, this is really scary for a pet parent because you have on one side people saying, hey, look, you know, the data is not there yet. We're still researching. Um, we haven't been able to find a link. But then on the other side, you have, you know, specific nutrition colleges, like let's just say UC Davis and Tufts as an example. And they keep the recommendations yes. is to stay away from what they term beg diets, B-E-G diets. And if you can't select a food based on their wasava guidelines that they talk about, to stay away from that food altogether. And, you know, I was going through some of those wasava guidelines and, you know, one of them was, what is the research that this company has done on their food and what are their like peer reviewed studies on the foods that they have? Do you think, Debbie, that this is a huge problem for the industry, like especially for a small manufacturer? Can a small manufacturer even meet those wasava guidelines? Because when, when I go into it, it only seems like there's a handful of companies that could even meet those recommendations? No, there aren't. I mean, it's, first of all, I, I think the big term is, I mean, it's a made up term. You know, it was made up by a group of veterinarians who I'm sure they're very well meaning and, and have good reasons for why they did, but it's not a widely known term with industry. It, it's not a widely respected term to be quite honest, um, because it's it seems to be taking a whole not even just one category of foods, but you know several categories of foods, and just setting them aside as well, these aren't good, which is not true, and and you know you can't you can't do that with entire categories. And my cat's walking into the picture, by the way. Um, <laughs> this is Deacon. And um, the other thing, on the like for you, as you mentioned for the wasabi with guidelines, I mean, this is not at all realistic. There are very, very few pet food companies who can afford to do that kind of research or any research. And the ones that can afford it, you know, they do share some some of it um, and, and publish it. But a lot of it is proprietary, and they are investing millions of dollars into it. So you understand that. Um, and so, because there isn't a lot of research available, just you know, in general about pet food and pet nutrition. You know, the companies can't afford to do that. We're talking, we're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to do a study, millions maybe. And you know, to add to that problem, there are only so many ways to do research because there's only so many university programs about companion animal nutrition. It is really, really challenging as a pet parent to go through those guidelines because you're right. I don't think, aside from the big three, I don't think there is a company that could meet those guidelines. And that would make, that would basically put the entire industry um, out of business. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, um, but, you know, do we, to the larger issue of the Wasaba guidelines and, and what are you know, pet parents to do and to know, there really is so little out there and it's very few companies that can afford to, to undertake studies. And it's just a fact, you know, we don't, the, the, the pet food industry doesn't have the funding from the government like human food would, which, you know, you can understand to some extent, but you know, they're just, there's just not a whole lot of dollars for it. And it's a problem. So do you think Debbie grain free is considered, of course, the darling of the industry? Um, and reading well, one of your articles and some articles, there seems to be now a lag, you know, it was continuously growing. And then now all of a sudden that growth curve is starting to dip. Would you attribute that to what's going on because of DCM? Or do you think there's other factors at play? Multiple factors. So, you know, you had, um, mentioned when we were corresponding by email that, you know, what, you know, why was there a grain-free boom to start with? Well, really, it was marketing. Like, I mean, there's there's no evidence showing that most dogs or cats 
do better on grain free, that grains are bad. I mean, even though that's the, you know, that was the whole ploy or the whole, you know, uh, reason behind having grain free was that, you know, that goes back to the whole, you know, eat like the wolf, they would consume a whole prey that would have grains in it. So they would eat grains. And, um, and, you know, there's, again, there's just no, there's scientific proof showing that grains are fine and none showing that they're bad for pets. Um, but, you know, it did take off and it, you know, it's, grew to what a good 25 percent of the overall market you know and even much higher in pet specialty and so you know it's it is a, it was the darling uh you know nosedive for some companies and for the category overall it's flat now compared to growing so it def- that the, the fda alerts have definitely had an impact on the green sales not only were the recommendations coming from a lot of these vet colleges on to follow sort of Wasava guidelines. But something else that's really important that comes out of there is the fact to stay away from raw foods at all costs. Now, I've read in some of your articles that in the categories of food that I know, although smaller, the raw food category seems to be surging. But then you have on the polar opposite side, these colleges that are saying absolutely stay away. Do you think that there's some sort of misfiring here? What is the confusion you think that's going on here? How can this be allowed to be sold in pet stores, but yet the FDA and the FSMA saying, oh gosh, this is bad. Where's the confusion? What's your take on this? That's a good question because it's, it sort of confounds me a little bit too. Um, you you pointed out, I mean, there there's a difference between commercially raw pet food, you know, manufactured in a way that is made to be safe and nutritionally balanced and complete and balanced and, you know, all the meeting all the laws and regulations. And then, you know, a, a, pet, a well-meaning pet owner in their um, kitchen mixing some chicken meat and potatoes and, and rice or whatever and giving that to their dog without knowing what else the dog needs. I think that's where it stems from because I think and this is just you know conjecture based on what I've read um, that I think a lot of veterinarians in the veterinary community in general, very general, big generalization here. I think they they equate raw food with the home you know home fed diets, and there is there have been studies showing that a lot of home fed diets complete. You know there there actually have been some researchers who've taken a lot, you know, they've taken all these recipes that are on the internet, for example, or in books, and they've made them themselves and then tested them for, you know, what nutrients are available. And they're not meeting the guidelines for a dog or a cat, whichever one it was intended for. And so, I mean, I think that's where it stems from, the the veterinary bias against raw foods. And they're not necessarily understanding that, as you said, there's commercial foods that, you know, where they, these companies are following, um, you know, FDA guidelines and AFCO uh, recommendations and ingredients for, you know, to make sure that they're complete and balanced. So I think that's where that's disconnected. Now for the FDA, um, you know, the unfortunate thing about the Food Safety Modernization Act, although I think it was a really good thing overall, and it's done a lot for the, for, you know, for the safety of foods and pet foods, but FDA decided as part of that, that they were going to have zero tolerance for salmonella in pet food, zero. Which just is, I mean, that's more stringent than what human food has. Human food, there's a to, there's a very low tolerance. Pet food is zero, which just isn't realistic because you know salmonella is everywhere in the environment. There's like 2,200 plus strains. It's everywhere. I mean, you could like you know have someone take a swab of your water glass right now, and there will probably be some very very minute level of something like salmonella. I mean, it just it's just a fact, and so. You know, pet food companies have to be very careful, and as they should be. I mean, they should be, they should be following the highest sanitation and hygiene and, quality, and safety and quality standards. But you know, I mean, if a if a FDA inspector comes in and takes a swab of, oh, in the warehouse, nowhere near open food or ingredients, and finds a speck of salmonella, they're you know they're supposed to do a recall. Even though it's never in the food, it's never anywhere near ingredients. It's never. I mean, you know, most pet food companies are set up to 
separate all the different steps and then raw ingredients from other processes. I mean, they have very, very strict protocols for that. Um, you know, the zero tolerance just isn't, you know, you know, a lot of times when you see more recalls, I guess it means that, that the rules are working, that the regulations are working, but it's also, it creates a lot of fear and, and mistrust among consumers that's unnecessary, I think, because it's just, you know, it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with the food at all. The other reason that, the reason that FDA says that they give for zero tolerance and in, in, um, pet food is that people handle pet food. And, you know, pets themselves don't necessarily always get sick from salmonella, but it's handled by people and that people with, you know, com compromised immune systems, the elderly, they, you know, they, they have gotten sick from it before. So that's where they come from. You add to that the fact that raw food, raw pet food, because it doesn't have the kind of same kind of what's called a kill step that you would have in dry pet food production or wet pet production, where, you know, the process itself, there's enough heat applied that it kills any kind of bacteria. You know, raw doesn't have that same kind of process, but there's a verified kill step. And so, I, you know, I think FDA has taken this stance that, well, raw pet foods is going to inherently be unsafe. And they have cracked down and, you know, done much more inspections of raw pet foods over the last several years. Um, or they've had the state, you know, feed regulators that they work with to do that. And so that's why you keep getting raw pet foods being in the news with, you know, salmonella problems. You know, again, most of the time it's in the environment and not in the food itself. And, and you know, I will say, you know, I think that there are raw pet foods companies that, that there are things that you can do to raw pet food to make sure any bacteria are killed. And there's companies that are reluctant to do that because they think it may, you know, like there's a perception that that's not truly raw because it's been treated some way. Well, you, you, you know, you have to find that balance because you have to ensure it's safe. And um, it's a very long winded way of saying that, you know, there's different biases at play here. I think the, I think the veterinary community has a, a certain bias and the FDA has a certain bias. Yeah. And, and I appreciate your take on that. I was, we were talking about this earlier, how um, I, you know, my, my TED talk, when I got my letter from TED that was flagged because I hadn't even said the word raw in it. I flashed, I, I remember putting a bowl of, uh, as an example, it was like primal pet food. And I put a bowl in it and I was referring to a study and TED had gotten a letter that uh, the FDA was against all raw food and veterinarians say it's completely dangerous and it's unbalanced and it's full of bacteria. And I tried to lobby with Ted and say, hey, there's commercially available raw that the, the FDA, you know, would have had to approve because it's all over stores across the United States and all over the world. But they couldn't decipher the differences. And, and I've been seeing that more and more, no matter what article I open up today. Um, you're right. There is a lot of media because there's so many recalls on raw food today. And there'll always be that classic paragraph at the bottom that says, you know, we spoke to a specific veterinarian and they said that raw foods are extremely dangerous. And my frustration is why does nobody differentiate commercially available balanced pathogen controlled raw food versus, you know, like, like you had mentioned, somebody that's whipping up something in their kitchen. Nobody's differentiating those two. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I'm not sure what the answer is. I, I know that, um, you know, there are, there are raw pet food companies that um, have done you know a lot of outreach themselves um there there was a raw pet food association although i think that has sort of morphed into something else and i'm not sure how active it is um but you know i i know that the that that segment of the industry is trying to do more to be more proactive about you know educating veterinarians fda etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean they have to educate the fda because they have them going into their plan all the time um you know, pet pet retailers, especially, you know, raw is one of their biggest categories, usually. You know, there's places that have, like, multiple freezers because, like, you know, to keep up the demand from the consumer. So you can't deny that people want it and that they're willing to pay for it. And if it's if they're, if it's safe food, why not? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of silly for, in my opinion, for, you know, regulators or veterinarians to try to poo-poo an entire category that, consumers obviously want that, you know, is good for, that, you know, they think is good for their pets and it's safe. Why not? It's, it's interesting, Debbie, if you go into Google search and you look at how the media works, the like number one, like the number one and the number two red articles, of course, one would be DCM. Anytime there's a DCM article, 
heavy, heavy hits, but then also raw food. Any single time there's a raw food article out, anything referencing any type of bacteria, it is always the most heavily read article. It almost seems like if if the media wants to get a quick bump or a quick boost, you know, just write something terrible about yes. about that category. It's almost like it's almost like clickbait. Yeah. You know? I want to switch to the magazine because for people that don't read okay. this, can you just talk a little bit about the pet food industry magazine and dot com? Sure. Um, well, as I mentioned, our, our primary audience are professionals who work for pet food companies and also the suppliers to the industry. And our what we try to do is just help those companies improve their businesses, better do their jobs. We try to focus a lot on new research, um, news. Really, the magazine anymore in this day and age is just a, a monthly representation of our content, if you will, because we're you know updating our website constantly. We have a daily newsletter. And really, I mean, we're trying to help our readers stay informed of what's going on related to pet food and the larger pet market. You know, we talked a lot about consumers having their eyes open by the melamine recalls in 2007. I mean, our readers, our, you know, our core audience, just eat up anything about what consumers think, consumer behavior, consumers po- uh, purchasing uh, habits, what consumers you know, are saying in surveys in terms of what they want to see in pet food or what they find overwhelming, or um, which is everything. And, and just, I mean, so it's a connection. We, we see ourselves as being a connection point, uh, if you will, between what we you know, know about consumers and pet owners and you know what the industry needs to know to better reach them and give them the products that they they want to buy for their pets debbie i am so so humbled that uh, you took the time out of your day to sit down and to and to chat with me even though your cat is 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 like feed me right now and you've 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 put me on the top of that list i'm, I'm so excited that you know we got to chat and you gave uh, you got to give the world a, sort of a take on what's going on i want to thank you so much for your time today and i hope that you can join me again to, to mind jam with me on a on a future podcast i would love to and thank you very much again for inviting me i really enjoyed it and thank you for your kind words Awesome. There you go. Yay. Yay.